Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another part, another edition of the Our Gallantin Podcast, hosted by myself, Bob Rahim, and esteemed co-host, Molna Sajid. Imam of Masjid Umar, head of the Paradise Academy, and avid volunteer at Our Gallantin. Today we have some very special and very uh, appropriate guests with us. We have Akif Hussein, who's a teacher at Bellevue Girls, uh, Bellevue Girls School in Bradford, and we have Asif, who's a teacher at Gems Metropole School in Dubai. And with it being the time where everyone's getting ready and everyone's getting geared up to school, we thought it would be really relevant to bring people um, who have experience in this area so we can start talking about this this time and what might be a little bit nervous for some parents. So um, let's see. Let's see. So um, Asif, tell us about yourself, teaching, lifestyle, where you are now, how you got there. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. So my, uh, I actually studied a um, degree in aerospace engineering. Um, and alhamdulillah, whilst I was doing my A-levels, I was really blessed to meet some uh, very passionate and dedicated brothers who set up a community school called Bradford Community School. And this was, mashallah, a charity-based school that catered for the needs of the local youth who required um, mentoring, motivation, educational support, and mashallah, anything and everything in between to more social interaction and well-being, mashallah. And they really inspired me. And that was my first experience of ed education. Um, whilst at university, alhamdulillah, I was an undergraduate tutor. Um, and though at that time, I'll be very honest with you, I, my mind was not fixed on going to the education field. Uh, as I was studying degree in aerospace engineering, did my master's. I uh, actually progressed into aviation, um, got my pilot's license and studied in the United States as a flying instructor. Uh, my ambitions were at that time obviously to be part of the RAF, but because I wore glasses, it was uh, a challenge that I, I found myself, I couldn't get passed. But my passion truly has always been in teaching and in education. So Alhamdulillah, um, I used my bachelor's and master's degree and then used that as a stepping stone uh, by means of completing a PGC in mathematics. And then since then, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, I've been teaching uh, in a variety of different schools, uh, different regions, Alhamdulillah, main, mainly mixed comprehensive schools, secondary schools. So I'm secondary trained as, and uh, Alhamdulillah, I have immense admiration for those teachers who are primary trained because I couldn't do that, mashallah. Those teachers are amazing. Um, so my specialism in mathematics. And I have, and then Alhamdulillah, taken on many roles, including um, the head of mathematics, assistant head. Most recently, I was in the. I've been in. This is my fourth year, mashallah, alhamdulillah, in the United Arab Emirates. So I worked three years in Sharjah as a head of secondary in the elite stream with the Ministry of Education, and now, alhamdulillah, I'm head of mathematics in uh, Gems Metropolitan School in Dubai. Mashallah. So, Asif, you're a local lad from Bradford, are you? I am born born in Bradford. Absolutely, alhamdulillah. Uh, you know, um, spent my childhood. Uh, I went to school, um, Fair with the Green was primary school, then Scotchman middle school, then mashallah, brother Akif and I. Obviously, we've gone way back before that, but then obviously, um, we studied in Roadsway, did an A levels there, and then Keithley College. So, you know, a local boy through and through. Okay, just like on our good podcast, we like to bring locals on. That mashallah have uh, achieved things and no alhamdulillah it's, 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 so it's, it's a privilege to be here from, alhamdulillah yeah. and, and the thing is you see um the lovely thing is teaching in your local community seeing the the young generation develop through it's a different time times are different to when we were at school but the essence is still the same uh, learning is just as important as it ever has been and alhamdulillah with the advancement of technology in the changing times it's made learning a different experience easier in some aspects different difficult than others but mashallah to watch the youngsters in the local community who who start from mashallah from a young age who now mashallah gone on to become doctors surgeons lawyers it's, it is alhamdulillah very fulfilling mashallah so Akif, tell us a bit about your history and how you go into teaching um, well, I used to do a lot of community work, um, sort of in and around sixth form and just after sixth form. 
Um, I actually did my degree in computer science. Uh, but at the same time, I was always working in the community centers, um, helping young kids with homework, um, helping them sort of discover stuff about IT. Uh, so that's where the background came. And when I finished the degree, I did um, a good couple of weeks doing some web design at a local company. And I thought, oh, my God, am I going to sit here for eight hours a day doing this? I absolutely hated it. Uh, took a chance, uh, applied for a PDC at Leeds, got in, and then from there not, didn't look back really. Uh, spent 11 years working out at Parkside um, Secondary out near Cullingworth, uh, worked my way up to head of IT there, and then um, I think it was about five years ago I thought, well, I worked out there, that was a predominantly mixed uh, white school. I thought I need to give a little bit back to my own community, and the opportunity came up at uh, Bellevue Girls. So I thought, why not? So um, now I'm working locally. It's a school just five, ten minutes up the road. Um, and again, it's like I went back to what I was doing originally. Originally, I was helping out all the young lads and lasses locally, and now it's uh, it's the girls locally. Um, the lads, I mean, I mean, there wasn't a job going in the in the local secondary that I enjoyed, which was a mixed one. But I'm doing football stuff with the with the lads, so I balance it out that way. So. And we've had you on the podcast before with Fairbank United and you told us all about the stuff you do yeah, there as well. So. That's, a different, that's a different thing. But yeah, um, in terms of secondary itself, um, yeah, it's it's just sharing that knowledge and trying to get people interested. And the fact that we have so few females in, in the IT industry, this, this is one way where I'm encouraging that and encouraging our girls to, to think beyond and uh, help raise their aspirations. And, and working in that working in that industry, I can I can pretty much echo what you said there. There really isn't um, that many females in the industry. Is it is an imbalance uh, of a male to female female ratio? So uh, a question I have for you guys. So both of you said like you got pretty successful, and you, you know, we're talking about aerospace, and you're after you're talking about computers there and stuff. So if you look at it from a from a outside view, and you look at it from a purely materialistic view, it you would pursue a career other than teaching because we all know it's not the most fruitful in terms of financial stuff. If you went into computing or you went into aerospace engineering, I'm sure you'd make a lot more money. So what What was the, I know actually you said that, that it, you just didn't feel it in web design. Um, so what was it that was that final click that you thought, actually, no, I want to I want to give back. I, I want to I wanna do something. I want to teach. Or that final penny that dropped that you said, no, I'm going to commit to this. Uh, if I'll answer that, inshallah, um, you're absolutely right. If you have the mentality that you're going to go into teaching and the money is going to be great and it's an easy life, then you've really not got the right idea. It, it, it is extremely rewarding, but very difficult in its own way. And you establish yourself, yourself over a period of time. And there's lots of things that you develop about yourself whilst teaching. Monetary, I guess, when you start off, though it's not fantastic there is progression so it's not a question of that teaching does remain a job that just not financially rewarding you can alhamdulillah uh, especially uh, in dubai financially the rewards are actually quite significant but the mindset of when you t when you start is if you it's it's not about money you're right it's not about the monetary rewards it's not about the financial incentives and it really for me was about giving back the, um, the knowledge that I've acquired, but also I, I think I also aspired to motivate and uh, to to give the opportunity for students to see the passion that I have for mathematics and also show them that there's so much more to mathematics because there is unfortunately that thing, I think people just say maybe it's like mama, you love it or you hate it. <laughs> for yeah. math, it's so essential. And I remember my mathematics teacher, Alhamdulillah, when I go back to Roger's school, he was amazing. He just was really inspirational and he just had a great sense of humor. But the way he delivered the subject, it just, you know, it, we, we were just always clinging on to what's coming next. And I know that if the teacher is not able to use a degree of enthusiasm and excitement, then it could be a very difficult subject. So that was first and foremost. And secondly, I'll be honest with you, I am a bit of a geek. I absolutely love teaching mathematics. I love uh, A-level maths and mechanics. Can't get away from it. Always ready to solve a puzzle, ready to look at the next problem and the next A-level question. So in a way, it's also fulfilling my inner soul and my desire to, mm -hmm. but, you know, to, to feed what I really enjoy as well, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. 
You got anything to add to that, Akif? Um, mine's slightly different because I, when I sort of started, I mean, I remember my original um, sort of the first sort of job I got was a, a tutor role at uh, Bradford Police Boys. Uh, we were helping kids uh, do their homework. And from a, a very early age, and I'm talking about 17, um, that sort of time I, I was thinking, well, this is something that I can do. This is something that comes naturally to me. Um, and when, you know, okay, there were, there were opportun a lot of opportunities at the time. It was just after the, um, as the, um, as the internet was developing and we were at a sort of exciting time and there was many fields I could have gone in there. I just thought I was comfortable with, teaching and with something that I knew that I was happy with and something that I, you just forget that personal reward from yourself when you see kids who, who sort of you know see that little problem and have it click and on top of that to be honest uh, IT wasn't a big thing and wasn't sort of uh, and uh, 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 you'll all know from your own time at school so you have that age where computers weren't prevalent and when they were no one knew what they were doing and the teachers didn't have a clue and weren't going to excite you about things uh, and so that was the other thing as well. This was cutting edge uh, technology and this sort of stuff that, you know, I thought need to be promoted in a, in a proper way. Unfortunately, a lot of schools um, throughout England have used IT as a sort of uh, a way of getting the league tables up and sort of made it boring through whacking out Word and Excel and Access and, you know, all these offices. But there's so much more to it. And it's that sort of thing where you're trying to get the creativity and trying to sort of get people to find that that little moment that little spark or where it inspires them and takes them into into various careers into there so that was mine slightly different way, way into it whilst i was doing my degree i'll be honest with you I, uh, there was no chance that uh, uh, teaching wasn't anywhere near it but towards the end it just it just happened and i fell into it and it was not the sure yeah yeah but, but bother on that point you know um i think any teacher that um you know, once uh, once to thrive in is the field. Uh, and our role starts to teach us this and really drill this in, and this terbiyat inside is that when you are a teacher, when you are an ustad, the, there's a big reason you're doing this, and the whole purpose is to make that individual. So what happens is now today when we see our children in front of us, you know, you look at them, you think, what does kismet? What what's what's going to happen in their life? Do you understand? And you could play a big part when you're when they're with you for about five years, six years. You know, you can mold them and you can uh, help them and you can guide them in many ways. So as an Ustad, as a teacher, you're a role model, you're a father figure, you know, you're there for them all the time. Uh, you're helping them, you're benefiting them, you're giving them knowledge. And like the best role model was our Nabi Kim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was sent, and the Prophet says, I was sent to teach people uh, good akhlaq, good character. So do you understand? So the thing is, uh, teaching is about molding an individual and a person. So yeah, sometimes uh, it's not just a monetary, uh, Marshall, you do get that as well. But apart from that, it's you know, what you can make out of a child, a person. And, uh, and when you see the results at the end, you think, Mashallah, when we look back, and I'm sure Akif and um, uh, Asif are in that boat where when they see some of their youngsters or their students that they taught and they've excelled in their life then you feel good that alhamdulillah you know um, these are my students that have excelled in their life they've achieved something they made something of their life and much of the giving back to community i think that's the biggest aspiration for a teacher i think just adding one point one more point as well and one which brought me back local to to bellevue i was uh, sat around uh, with all the cousins one need and um, there's a, another cousin of ours who, who's Sort of had a foray into the secondary education field and did a lot of work setting up a, a, one of the free schools and he made a, a cutting comment where he said um, and i'm sure it was directed at me because he generally uh, did it in a roundabout way but it was uh, sure. that you know when we grew up we didn't see many role models in teaching but a lot of our teachers were white <laughs> were middle class and there was uh, a lot of misunderstanding as well we we had and there were various you know lads that, who we were with who were always in trouble because there wasn't an understanding of where they come from what their background is and the fact that now you know we've got a generation of teachers now that, that have grown up i think it's very important that they are in uh, schools with muslims with you know asians in there because we do understand it and we can get that extra bit out of them um and that was one of the reasons why i moved from the predominantly white school i think it was important i was there as well because i was 
those uh, white kids um, never saw an Asian face. They were on the outskirts of uh, Bradford, and their perception of Muslims and Asians in the inner city was was very different to to what it was. And me being there sort of helped break down barriers that way. But then this goes the other way as well. Me being in, in this uh, school that I'm in now. I understand their backgrounds, I understand where they are. I know a lot of the parents have played football with a lot of the the, the dads. Um, and uh, that sort of knowledge uh, as well, you know, not just from the academic knowledge, but, but the, the sort of emotional and social and cultural needs as well, it, it also plays a very important part, uh, especially with our kids, which is helping sort of with their retainment as well. Marshall, so we're at a time now where it's, it's people are getting ready to go back to school. Um, and that's not so much new, right? We're in, we're in just that time of year, and it happens every year. But there is a special um, edge, and then there's a difference this time, where it's COVID, and people have been off school for, like, months now. And we're talking in the UK, it's been, like, five or six months that they've been off. And we have to mention COVID. It's almost like the elephant in the room. Um, and a lot of parents are apprehensive. I've got my kids uh, that are going back, and he's also going back to Mustard, which we're going to talk about. But... Going back to school and and how they're gonna deal with it and stuff like that. Um, so the first of before we go going back to school, how how has it been dealt with over in Dubai? Because maybe we can learn some lessons. So, um, Asif, how how's COVID been held uh, and teaching during COVID and you know the end part of the year uh, that we've gone through and even the start of the new year we're teaching now. How's that been handled over in Dubai? So in the in the initial instance, um, when the outbreak took place, there was obviously great concern. But mashallah, um, the the infrastructure, though it's strong enough, so much effort, so much money, so much energy is put into making sure that the 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 actual not just the school infrastructure, but in terms of the telecommunications was made available to everybody. Uh, in terms of the ministry schools, which is where where I was working at. Students were provided laptops. They were given um, payments were made in terms of paying for the internet and broadband. So there was huge push to make sure everything's online. I have to say, Alhamdulillah, upon looking back now, it was done in very very quickly but successfully. All learning took place online, and we typically used I think uh, many schools used Microsoft Teams, uh, and teachers really it was um, basically trial by fire just jump in the deep end, explore how it works, see how it is. But Alhamdulillah, it was a, a good means of communicating. So just like now, we're talking to each other, but instead the teacher would prepare the lessons. You could share your PowerPoint, you could share your worksheet, you can upload them for each other. The interaction was good. It doesn't substitute, obviously, the live interaction. But because the COVID was very much a reality and the rate of infection in all parts of the world was increasing, but then it wasn't. It wasn't a situation of okay, let's just shut down. So in Dubai, the um, a, a concerted effort was made to make sure all students. We're not just talking about the local Emiratis. We're talking about all students were given provisions to study online. Now, what's happened over time is this: the dynamics have changed a bit. And you will have heard of something that's called blended learning. Now, blended learning is whereby you have some students who are taught in school in small numbers to maintain safeguarding. So they're very vigilant and very precise and, you know, uh, in, in all action that's taking place because safety is paramount now. It's the most crucial thing. And then, of course, there's uh, uh, online learning that's taking place at the same time. There's another thing that's called hybrid learning, which is what we are going to be implementing in uh, the GEM school in Dubai. And what that is, we have alternating students. So 50% of the students come in on certain days, and the other days, 50% of them come in. But at the same time, whilst the students are at home or in alternating days, they are online. There's t learning taking place at all times. The ratio is such that we're maintaining the two meter distancing actually legally it's been changed to one and a half meters now but they are making sure that all these measures are put in place um, a couple of days ago we were all i mean every single teacher were required to do and it became a mandatory uh, covid 19 test um they have installed cameras in school the thermal cameras are certain entry entrance points. They have staggered points now, so schools open for a longer period of time so that it can allow students to come in and maintain social distancing. We have sanitization systems throughout the school. We have maybe triple the amount of cleaning 
and on-site staff to maintain health and hygiene regulations. Um, it's mandatory to wear face masks. The, the concern was for some students who require um, uh, visual aids, who require lip reading, oh, who lip reading. require for example, we've got different types of visual, auditory, kinesthetic learners. So uh, visors, um, face guards are being provided. So they are really trying their best to pull out all the stops. And, and, and the reason why I want to share this information, and this is not just actually for the teachers in Dubai, and I, I'm sure Brother Akif can uh, echo this with the schools in the UK, there is a massive, massive push towards maintaining education in uh, in an environment that is safe and regulated and maintained and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah i'm going to be sending my daughter to the same school that i'm going to and if i didn't have the confidence quite simply she would stay at home because it's not mandatory to send my daughter to school but i'm choosing to do that because the the the, the regulations the procedures are mashallah extremely rigorous now with with something like the covid of course you cannot guarantee the spread of infection but alhamdulillah what we have to also think about is what we do at home it's not just in school so we have to be vigilant at home but learning is absolutely essential and inshallah i would like to give parents the confidence too that inshallah we are getting back into i mean this is a new norm now we have to accept that but what we can't do is leave our students at home our children at home should i say and hope that home learning will suffice because it's not the same it's not the same so what i will say is i have confidence i am nervous as a parent of course i will not lie to you still apprehensive but i'm confident from what i see with my own eyes or what i'm implementing and practicing that the correct measures and procedures are being put in place and alhamdulillah alhamdulillah most schools have this approach and most schools are open in the United Arab Emirates. MashaAllah. So that's 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 Dubai and UAE. What about in the UK, Akif? How how are the schools preparing? Well, um, I mean, I've just heard that, and I'm just thinking, wow, you know, um, the, the authorities in Dubai are so on the ball and uh, sort of uh, mm. been on it all the way through. Our government has made um, a complete mess of things, um, and we, we all have heard of various U-turns and the exam fiasco. But despite the lack of sort of uh, effort from above, the schools have been doing a fantastic job uh, in terms of the way they've adapted and uh, come across with, with the various ways uh, that they've uh, put online learning in place. We have had a lot of issues. Uh, we've had issues with kids not having the internet, kids not having a laptop. Mm kids with larger families you know haven't shared a, a laptop so we've had we've had lots of different issues there but in terms of getting back to school the head teachers have been working really hard and the prior the priority has been safety um like us if they my daughter also goes to the same school that uh, i have and i'm fairly confident uh, that you know things will be in place we we uh out unlike uh, in dubai it's mandatory for people to, to come back to school here on top of that um, what we've been working on is a, a system of bubbles. So if, for example, what we've done is each year group is going to be in a particular bubble. They're going to be isolated from the rest of the year groups. Um, and if there's an issue in year 10, uh, and God forbid there is a, a COVID outbreak there, it's only year 10 that will be going off and then they will be doing online learning uh, for the 14 days. Uh, upon entry, uh, whether he's catching a school bus uh, or when you're coming up to the school, you're wearing masks. Uh, masks will be worn in corridors and at pinch points where where there is mixing. But within the classroom, uh, masks uh, will be taken off. There's an option to wear the shield if, if they want to. But the, the sort of uh, guidance is that uh, we allow kids to remain safe within that bubble. Uh, a lot of schools, what they're doing is they're, they're changing their breaks and lunchtime so the mixing doesn't occur. Um, there are issues with it, but the I mean, I don't agree with the government on a lot of things and the, the handling of this, but one key statement that came out last week, uh, personally, I think it's more dangerous for kids to be sat at home worrying about COVID and get, you know, the small chance of them getting COVID than not being at school and missing out on their learning. Um, COVID to younger children and teenagers, you know, okay, there's a chance, but it's a very, very small chance. Uh, in comparison to the damage that, that them being at home and not getting on with their, their learning is going to cause. 
and that's uh, the sort of breakthrough point that we need to do when they enter school there's sanitizers everywhere every lesson uh I, I teach IT, so they'll have to sanitize. They'll be wiping the keyboards down. Every free lesson, we're going to be having what's called a fogging machine, which is rolled into a uh, into a classroom. And uh, what happens with that classroom is then that's decontaminated. There's a, a sort of an aerosol which uh, which is spread all over the place, which uh, cleans everything. And that'll be done throughout the day. Our cleaning uh, rows are going to be sort of increased. Uh, and uh, sort of increased money has been pumped in uh, all the cleaning areas and we've got tons of resources we, we, which are going to be used so from uh, you know a british standpoint going back we're gonna, you know there's always a chance but we are going to be working hard to keep them as safe as we can but the the, the sort of the whole procedure starts at home as well so regular washing of hands regular sanitizing all that needs to be done and needs to be a habit made from home brought into school and that's where it needs to continue as well so there's the point where oh sorry Molina, sorry go on. Sorry, Baba. Um, I think on that point, uh, which Masha Asif and Akif have mentioned, I think uh, to, to the parents, I think the confidence that we can give them is that Masha, all the schools and the governments are doing all their bit to keep the children safe, and I think obviously that's the most paramount thing that we keep children safe. And I, I think like Akif just mentioned, a very important point. You know, kids have been home for six months, and one thing. Um, talking to parents is the mental health of the children and the physical health of the children it doesn't help you know when you're at home and you're not in a routine i remember the first few months of lockdown people tried their best you know keeping a routine and but slowly slowly when the lockdown increased and you know it's difficult to maintain if you don't have a structure to the day so i think school bring the structure to your day going back to madrasa in the evening the structure to your day so all these things are important i think parents need to uh, get out and uh, you know especially next week when schools do reopen that they start taking their children back to some kind of normality uh, and the better that in, uh, the quicker they're in a routine and normality the better they'll feel uh, they'll feel good and the children will feel good and uh, you know unfortunately the teachers and the schools get criticized but uh, a lot of the children and families are, are going out monday tuesday wednesday for whether they're 50 percent off for meals and nobody talks about social distancing there or whatever and uh, so i'm saying you're okay to go there but you're not worried uh, you know you're not okay to send them to school where they're learning where they're benefiting so i think you know we've got to um, balance this properly and uh, understand that when they go back to school the schools are taking all the measures that they can uh, for the safety of the children and they're here to provide an education um, and I think that's what, as parents, we all need to understand that, you know, we've got to get back to some kind of normality. And the quicker we get back into a routine normality, inshallah, the things will improve. On that second point is that before COVID, you know, we used to take precautions and everything, but sometimes we used to lead the reliance upon Allah as well. If somebody became ill or whatever happened in our life, we would say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajun, it's happened from Allah, you understand? So I have to take all these precautions in school, whatever. God forbid, if there's an outbreak, whether we teacher, parent, student, whatever it may be, you know, we still got to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You know, we've taken all the precautions. We can't go finger pointing at schools or, you know, they're doing what they can. But sometimes, if it's to be, it's to be. You understand? So I think, you know, uh, let's get back into normality. Let's get back to the way that we used to think, and uh, hopefully, things will get better. Yes. Inshallah, if I can, if I can just add something to that, there's actually some research that's been done uh, in terms of students who've been off for this period of time to the students who at least had some distance learning, and then additionally, uh, students have actually received some private tutoring, and it just shows that not only do you break the routine, but the the mental, the psychology behind, like Molana Sab said, it does have a huge impact. And, and can you and, and can you imagine what it must be like for the youngsters? They will also feel apprehensive. So it is absolutely essential that yes, we maintain the precautions. But like you said, Mulana, so trust in Allah and try to do your absolute best because education is important. And if if it's if it's something that's going to be neglected for a long time, it can have secondary issues that can cause impact on the child not just in terms of the learning but in terms of their behavior their attitude their mannerism so inshallah, inshallah a lot is being done 
there's you can't guarantee everything but also uh, correct me if i'm wrong but the usually the um, infection and uh, and the spread of COVID is not typically from the youngsters within a certain age, and by all means, do correct me. But so there, there is a there is a safety net there as well. So inshallah, inshallah, the, when the academic year starts. So for example, we are anticipating full students, as I said, in a system that has alternating days. And inshallah, I'll recommend to the parents whether this in the UK, whether it's in the UAE, or whatever any parts of the world, try your absolute best to maintain the um, precautions at home and at school and then send the students to school inshallah so as someone who's been through the education system and someone who's alhamdulillah come out the other side i i understand the value of the education system but i'm going to play devil's advocate slightly and i want to ask a question to the teachers here right so why so eager so we have these five months off we've had we've had this online learning kids are still learning why is it so important to go back now for the children what will they so if we send them forward 10 years why will they if they took the extra month off of sex wait until the vaccine what's the impact that that's going to have in their careers in their in their like you said their mannerisms what's the downside why don't we just wait until they say a vaccine's coming by the end of the year let's say a vaccine's come give us a vaccine then we'll go back to school why now well, uh, I'll just come in on that. The first thing um, we're all, we've been hearing in recent months about the Oxford vaccine and how it'll be ready at the end of September and it could be rolled out. In Russia, there's a vaccine and that, that's been rolled out. The thing is, uh, we haven't got a clue when an actual working vaccine is, is going to work. And if we're waiting for that, we could be waiting three or four years. That, um, I mean, a few years ago, you had the SARS virus and that was about four or five years ago. They still haven't got a vaccine for it. It may be that we may be in this for the long haul. The other impact is we've got kids who have just gone from year 10 into year 11 or some from year 12 into year 13 who've missed out on six months worth of work. That six months, you know, that impact is going to be felt further up the line, whether it's those applying for university degrees or those going from GCSE to A-levels. Uh, the basics that the kids are missing out on down at primary school and uh, in sort of early secondary, all these things are going to have an impact later on uh, to their academic uh, learning. So it, the sooner they are back, uh, the better for all, and in particular, the better for them. Monans have talked about the, the mental, there's a physical impact, the, the getting into the routines, all these and the things that, that, you know, what's called the hidden curriculum. So the aspects of, you know, mannerisms and the way they should be behaving and sort of uh, opening doors for others. All these little things are all also missed out because what's a person doing when they're at home? Not everyone is learning at home. Um, the people who have got the equipment, the people who are slightly richer and can afford, you know, a, a laptop each um, or have got good internet connections, they, they may be okay. And, you, know, they, you know, they may be able to survive it. But think about... The people who, who are all cramped into a two-bedroom house, think about you know the poor internet connections, think, think about kids who are just trying to access the curriculum off their phone. Uh, not everyone is, unfortunately, equal, and not everyone has got the resources. I know the government did say they're going to get a laptop, to, a laptop out to all these kids, but then they're getting the laptops out. These laptops are there, but these kids haven't got internet access. You know, uh, How does that work? Uh, the fact that it took... Uh, up to the summer holidays for them to get a hold of a laptop and then it was the holidays and there was no online learning then. So a lot of these things need to be taken into place and not everyone unfortunately in our society is equal. So for those who are really struggling, it's very important for them to be back. And for those who have managed to, to get by, the other thing that this uh, lockdown has taught us is uh, online learning isn't really a, a, a substitute for proper teaching from a, you know, a perspective of you know, getting those that know the kid and be able to find and tweak and fine tune things. Um, something online is never going to replicate that. That's if I can, if I can just add to that, I, I think this is the thing you see. Bear this in mind. Just on the last point there, there have been online tutors for a long time. Be it, you know, your t the teacher that you know, be it outsourced from different countries. It will never substitute actual learning, but then the uh, the key thing here is the hidden curriculum. There are so many things that are weird that you learn from the actual teacher. Remember the teachers, mashallah, have a high status in Islam. It's not just a responsibility, for example, for me, just to teach mathematics. 
there is so much more to it. And, and, and doing that online is sometimes not possible. And yes, of, of course, when the pandemic, the outbreak started, we were uncertain, we didn't really know, and it's been potentially six, seven months, for some students been less, for some students potentially it's been more. But the thing is, you see, you will never be able to substitute the actual teaching that takes place face to face. And mashallah, Brother Baba, you asked a question that was really fantastic, you posed, and playing the devil's advocate is really important at this point, because some parents will be thinking, well, hang on a second, if online learning has been working reasonably well, like, Jalo, I'll get a better internet connection and I'll get a laptop, etc., etc., and it'll be fine. That would just won't cut it. That just won't cut it because the thing is, the home learning requires so much more for it to be effective. So, inshallah, with the precautions that I'm placed, the learning that we've given in school, with the correct measures, with the correct standards, with the correct precautions, inshallah, will allow the bridging of the gap to happen because a lot of learning has been lost. And especially for the key groups who really need to prove themselves. I know that there's been a huge fast in the UK government with regards to the algorithms and the prediction grades. They don't really help you to understand the capability of the students. So let's just say some students have got the ill of grades, they made the grades, they've not really studied it sufficiently. And when it comes to, like you said, maybe years down the line, maybe not 10 years down, but the immediate next few years, they might not necessarily have the skills to progress and then they require additional support and help. So it's important to 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 break the um, that difficulty and to move forward and actually go into school and inshallah start the learning process face to face. Mashallah, and I know I was playing devil advocate, but there's two points that, if, if you don't mind, I, I, I want to add to that is one, you don't get the enthusiasm the same as as a teacher because body language big, and I know working from home and when I work with the team uh, and we do the same thing, we're on teams and we're like this to do that. The, the conversations you have over this sort of virtual reality and the conversation you have face to face is totally different. You understand so much more from someone's body language, their facial expression, that staring into a camera and looking at somebody is, is two different things. And the last thing is something that we had on a couple of podcasts ago about reading. And the, the thing that the brother please mentioned there was because our children uh, as an Asian community start to read a little bit later, it takes them from that age of till about 40 before they catch up. And that's just about the reading age is catching up. And if we're talking here about so much more, we're talking about mathematics, we're talking about English, we're talking about IT, we're talking about science, we're talking about just understanding basic logic. I don't know the numbers, but I can only imagine how much of a setback that, that that's going to be. Um, and that's just, just, just the understanding it's also about the It's about the environment. And what school is is, is an environment of learning. and no matter how much we try to create that at home uh you know as parents we're not all experts in specific fields uh we try our best to be best teacher to our children so that's why you send your child to a school um and uh, even we've seen online it's good but it, it's definitely not the answer to real teaching and like uh, you know when you have your start or teacher in front of you and teaching you uh, it's somewhere else that one-to-one -one, um and, and, and I, there's no substitute for that. And I think that's one of the greatest things I've learned on uh, while teaching online in the last few weeks. Uh, there's no substitute, especially with younger children, it's very difficult. Uh, to, their concentration span, focusing for even an hour just on the computer, it, it's difficult. And uh, Mosa, that's a really good point. Because when my son asked me about some programming questions, I love it. I'm just like, yes, let's go. And I'll go into all these big explanations and I'll spend ages. He asked me something about science, and I was like, uh, okay, let's Google. <laughs> I don't have the expertise in science, I have the expertise in IT. And I'm sure a lot of parents are having that experience. All right, so there's another, I got, I got to talk about another another big thing here. So there's a, a big uh, thing going around uh, on the social media about if you send your child into school, and this is in the UK, and I don't know if it's in Dubai, but uh, uh, actually, we'll, we'll let us know if this has gone around in Dubai as well. Um, so. If you send your child into school and they test positive or they have symptoms for COVID, right, there's a particular video going around on, on uh, social media that the authorities will come and they'll take your children and they'll take them to some secret location and they'll uh, hold them for 14 days and you won't be able to get in touch with them. So because this is, I know it's going around in the UK, uh, Akif, 
what's the what's the deal with this are you going to take our children and lock them up for 14 days mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we're we're planning to take everyone's children. We're going to lock them away. Uh, can't barely looking after our own children. What we're going to do with them? <laughs> uh, no, it is false. Uh, no one is planning to take your kids away. Um, you know, it's just one of these ridiculous rumors that, that was going around. I know Bradford Council have been doing a lot and trying to send around videos to dispel this this thing that has been uh, going around. Um, the I mean the standard procedures will always apply if there's a, a threat to a child um, social services will be involved that's a very different thing to what's going on uh, on right now if your child is suffering from COVID symptoms or if there's a test and it comes back positive and they have to be in school they will be isolated and then you will be contacted and you'll be told come pick them up or arrange for them to go home so it's safe for them um not quite sure where this has come from or someone's tried to read a really complex bit of legislation and sort of gone up the some been sent up the wrong garden path somehow but yeah we can uh, safely say that your kids will not be taken away from you if they have a cough or if they have a headache or if they lose their sense of smell we will send them back to you so you're yeah, as quick as possible i'm guessing right yeah, you're yeah. Them, not us. <laughs> <laughs> So um, no, this is this is this is not happening in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, it's, it's quite clear. Any instances, basically, be it adults, be it children, you're sent from self isolation, and you're required to do the mandatory COVID test. And I, I think that's you have to respect that. I think that's fair. I think you want to make sure that if the, a child has um, indicated positive results, then that child self-isolates and does not affect other students but there's nothing uh, nothing further to that and alhamdulillah we're as, as teachers as educators be it whether you're a senior leadership or, or whatever aspect we'll always always share information with parents at every single stage i think uh, the other point i think sorry just one one other point the the chance of a child testing positive as well is very very low i mean mm -hmm. all the research done you know you, you're putting it into i know under 11s it's not point not five percent or something of kids uh, have tested positive for covid so it's a very small minute number that you know if, if the thing if it does happen it'll, it'll happen slightly larger for secondary school kids but again the under 19s are, are not showing and this is you know it, it's an illness and there's, there's a lot of negative things about it but the one sort of saving grace of this illness is it doesn't affect the young as much as it affects the the elderly unlike something like flu or some of the other diseases which just take everyone out this one is you know the young are protected from it so we, we need to bear that in mind that the, the chances of them getting it are very very low which is why you know schools are opening up otherwise they, they won't take, take this chance now, on that point i think we also got appeal to the community that we don't keep on spreading lies and rumors and uh, because we, especially with whatsapp it's, it's like fire now you just get a message and oh no and then what happens if we send it if you are concerned i'm sure you can link Bradford authority the council whoever maybe the school and get in contact and say look i have a concern is this true and you know they will answer you but rather than just getting a whatsapp message and, and forwarding it to the next person and creating an atmosphere of you know fear and scare i think unfortunately we're good at that because what happens is we always think oh no don't do this because they're going to do this and they're going to do this and we always have this a misconception and i think from young age that um, they're always going to take your children away and nobody takes children away unless something there's you know some danger uh, a family may be a danger to the child or whatever it may be there's some danger to the child you know, otherwise the nobody is going to take no ch a child away, and I think we've got to be careful in just spreading lies and rumors and whatever. And if you have any concern, ring the relevant authorities, and I'm sure they'll answer your question. And on that, so note, Masab, uh, doesn't Islam Islam also um, promote the fact that we shouldn't spread lies, or if we don't know? So if something comes to us, is there something in Islam that says actually before I pass this on, I need to check? It's my responsibility to check before I pass it on. Yeah, and then you can't spread rumors. Uh, and as a symbol and a sign of Muslim of is being truthful, uh, being sick, and Nabi Sassam was known to be sadiq, I mean, the most truthful, the most truthful one. And why? Because in every action he did, whether he spoke the truth or whether uh, he 
he kept somebody's good for a possession for a certain amount of time and he would return it. He was a, a trustworthy person. A Muslim should be a person who, you know, if there's some message that's got to a person, yeah, investigate it, find out where you come from, is this true? Uh, ring people, relevant people, ring your school, ring the council and ask them, look, we are concerned. And, uh, and with this rumor, um, like Alkis mentioned, Rafa Council themselves have made a video uh, dispelling all these rumors that no such thing can happen. So, you know, we've got to be careful because we fear, fear in our own community, in our own children. Our children read these messages and they think, oh, no, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to, you know, my dad's not going to know and I'm going to be taken away from them. And, and then what's happening? Nobody, <laughs> everybody's getting to send their child back to school uh, simply because of the, all these false rumors. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, we have the authority to keep our children, you know, and we have rights over our children and nobody can just take them away. And if you have any such concerns, you know, ring the relevant bodies and they will answer your question. Masab, there's a question in the comments. Do you want to you just uh, address the comment? Yes. Yes, there's a question. Uh, Masab, could you please ask about RSE? How will this affect Muslim children in state schools? RSE is Relationship Sex Education. The first, uh, I know last year, or was it the year before, we did, um, especially here in Bradford, we held a big, large event, raising the concerns, uh, especially same-sex uh, marriage and everything that's going to be taught in schools. And uh, So um, first, I think Akif and uh, if Asif will answer this question. Uh, what we're also going to do, we, we are thinking of doing a special podcast just regarding RSE, and I've got relevant people that will talk about those topics specifically. But so, uh, as these teachers that they're here, we, uh, we can touch upon this again. Yeah, this was a, a bit of legislation brought in a couple of years ago um, regarding um, what you know they were broadening out the topics uh, that they were teaching our kids, and it was something that, that concerned me and a lot of teachers who, who were you know asked that we, we may have to teach this as well. Um, my personal standpoint is this is the law now and teachers will have to teach it. So what do we do about it at home? And this is the, the big concern that if we are not teaching and having these conversations with our kids at home, the first point of contact is going to be schools. And some of these teachings, um, you know, it's a lot of it is about equality and a lot of it is, you know, uh, about how, uh, things stand in terms of the law and how how people should be treated and Islam teaches us a, a, a lot of things in terms of you know not being preju prejudicial and you know we, we've got a lot of things in there but then there are things that are contrary to, to what we believe there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with people but you know to the, there is that right there to at least respect all the other people's beliefs um, and my main concern is now some of this teaching is aimed at older secondary school kids. I know there's a big hoo-ha about it being taught at primary. I'm um, more concerned at what happens at the secondary school age. Um, the reason for that is at primary, they go to madrasa, any questions that they have really should be counted by, by teaching at madrasa. But a lot of times we find that madrasa ends at, for kids at age 11, age 12. What happens after that? And suddenly they haven't got a point of contact and they're being given ideas that are contrary to our beliefs um, or you know uh, which may get you know force them to ask questions and they've got nowhere to go so this is where you know our parents need to be educated our uh, imams need to be able to answer these questions or and come on the front foot on this rather than react because now there's nothing we can do about it it is in law it is going to be taught um, how do we combat that? How do we, we react to it? That's something as a community and uh, as an individual we need to do. As if I don't know if something similar, uh, I doubt something similar will have been passed. In the, in no, the, no, 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 no. Yeah. He is it's very different. Um, quite simply, in state schools, not taught at all. Not all. It's not in the curriculum. In terms of the bio biological side of things and in terms of reproduction, in terms of aspects that are common themes to the curriculum part, but in terms of sexual education, things like that, no, they're, they're not taught at all. But the things I just want to just to add, this is, uh, from my understanding, mandatory now in the UK, and it will be taught 
It will be tough. It's, it is a question of how it's going to be dealt with. You can't, I think, if you look back in all the previous times, you could opt out. That option is not really there now, and the teachers have to take responsibility in whichever shape or form. So as a parent, the question is, how do you then find ways of coping with that and maintaining the integrity of Islam? Because just neglecting that, ignoring that, like Brother Aki said, the first point of contact will be school. And it is based on equality and fairness, but sometimes these moderate and liberal thoughts may not reflect well with not necessarily more reserved thinking, but thinking that is aligned with Islam, for example. So if you choose to completely ignore it, you would tend to find you're going to be in more difficult uh, and a harder situation. For example, my daughter is very young. In the UK, she would be exposed to this. Now, that doesn't make me feel comfortable, but what I will try to do is speak to my daughter in a way that I would obviously try to make it such that it's very neutral based and it's not inclined in towards a particular way. But uh, Brother Akifa, you're absolutely right. It is a bigger challenge in secondary school. And it's really about how parents and madrasas work together to deal with this because it's not something that can be ignored. Uh, I think that's point, you, you know, um, I think the parents, and I think last year the greater concern were with primary school children because I think once you get to high school, one thing is when a, a child starts to mature, where the parents have words with their children. Uh, about puberty, about you know body changing. Uh, also in high school, you accept that these things you you might start talking about, and kids accept it. Um, that's you because there's a, a school in Birmingham, a primary school where um, I think the deputy head was he himself was from that particular community, and uh, they really pushed out this uh, curriculum. Uh, and I remember sp speaking to a local primary school here, which I'm involved with. And they were saying to me, RSE is a relationship sex education, but that's not compulsory in primary schools. Only relationship education is compulsory in primary schools. In high school, RSE is applicable, but in primary school, only relationship education. So they won't talk about sexual education in primary schools. So it gave me some kind of comfort, but then when they talk about a relationship education, what they're going to talk about, and you're going to see pictures about in primary schools, before you would have seen a picture of a father and a mother, and you would have said dad and mom. But you're, now you're going to see two moms' pictures together, which is acceptable in today's society, not in Islam, but in today's society. You'll see a picture of two dads. So what will happen is they will, they will talk about these are normal relationships in today's world. Yes, and 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 that country, you know, against our beliefs and our religion. Uh, but because we live in a non-Muslim country, we have to accept they will teach this, and we have to counter um, this, whether it be education at home, uh, in our madrasas. Uh, and I know there, uh, in the background, a lot of work is going on, especially in madrasas, to tackle this uh, kind of talk. And but remember, you know. When we were children, we were very uh, innocent um, and we never had, you know, the iPads and the internet. And I think we had a better upbringing in the sense that we enjoyed our freedom. We used to play outside 10 hours a day, 8 hours a day, whether we were playing football, whether it's going around smashing up people's dens or whether it's, you know, hide and seek or whatever it was. Now, unfortunately, kids, and forget anybody else, our own kids, they have an iPad in front of them for three, four, five, six hours, and they're exposed to everything, you know, mm -hmm. that's against Islam, you know. And we, the thing is, we're happy just to give them that um, iPad or that iPhone, and they're exposed to everything. So unfortunately, kids probably know a lot more than what we knew at that age. We were innocent, and uh, so that's why we've got to counterattack this by, like you said, from a young age, talking about these issues and because kids will be exposed to it we can't stay silent anymore we can't think oh yes somebody else is going to answer it we have to talk about it in the house yes it won't be a comfortable uh, conversation but because it's exposed in schools it'll be easier to talk about do you understand so and i think you know then you do talk about look whatever people we have to respect other people's beliefs and other people 
uh, especially in this country of equality they talk about. So we've got to respect other people and whatever they do and their actions. But as Muslims, this is who we are and this is what we do. And, and that if we've got to drill Islam inside our children. And I think that's where, um, uh, you know, that's the most important part that we teach our children throughout and we keep on telling them what's the Muslim perspective of everything. And, and that's all you can do. Um, and I, I'm sure that will come more from the mosques and the madrasas. Uh, hopefully parents can start talking about this. And uh, I think a lot of people have the fear, especially in primary school. Uh, I think high school, you then tend to accept that your children are growing up and they are going to learn about these things. MashaAllah. So we've been on for almost an hour, so I want to start bringing the podcast to a close. So on on what we've been talking about and children going to school and starting starting shortly, I'm going to ask the guests for their closing comments uh, and any reassuring or any a, any comments they have. So we'll start with Asif. Why? Any comments to to give to children, give to parents on, on going back to school? I think I think first and foremost, I'd like to obviously reassure parents and echo what we've said throughout this period of time that Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, measures have been put in place. And though nothing can be perfect, these stringent measures do reduce the rate of infection, do prevent COVID from spreading. Amashah, Brother Akif, uh, you've obviously reaffirmed that obviously the spread of this disease is unlikely with um, under 19s. And statistically, as you go further down the age group, the less so. But they also, what I don't want to miss out is the message to the students that, you know, Alhamdulillah, you, you've had. A long summer break. You had a very long summer break. <laughs> but what you have to also think about is taking responsibility. Do not think, okay, it's just responsibility of the parents. Please do not think it's just the responsibility of the teachers. It is also your responsibility to maintain hygiene, to maintain social distancing, to make sure you follow the basic and simple rules, to respect what is being asked of you. But at the same time, don't forget about the joys of learning, being in school. You may not be able to socialize and, and integrate with your friends as would have been in the past, but there's a special bond and relationship that you develop with your teachers and with your friends. And that remember that learning is all about making mistakes and figuring out what those mistakes are. So don't be nervous, don't be, don't be apprehensive. I know you all will be, but it's really important that you just give yourself the inner strength to say that inshallah, that I will try my best, I will follow the rules and regulations, and then I will do my level best to improve my learning. And over time, you will feel comfortable. Practice makes perfect. It's the same for us adults as well. Just want to reassure the students that inshallah, enjoy your learning, practice uh, safety precautions, and uh, it may be a long time that this is how we practice learning. So do not assume that whether it's going to be a vaccine that's going to be available or it's okay, I can learn at home. Inshallah, have confidence. And of course, we all trust in Allah. And inshallah, the best will happen for all of us. MashaAllah. Akif, closing comments? Um, look forward to going back. Um, this is one of the things that I'm five months off and I'm back this week and I'm thinking to myself, oh, bloody Allah, you know, am I, am I ready for it? Uh, let alone anything else, uh, gonna have the the issue. We're, we're all gonna have issues, and we're all gonna have teething problems. But at the end of the day, let's enjoy it. Um, you only go to school once. Enjoy this period of your lifetime. You haven't. A lot of the kids will not have seen their mates for for six months. Um, I haven't seen a lot of my colleagues. Have just been bobbing in, bobbing out. Um, learning isn't, you know, is, isn't only about the academic side. It's the social side as well. Um, and a lot of people have, have missed out on that. And let's just see what happens. Don't worry too much about the COVID side. So long as you take the precautions that people are asking you to do, hopefully everything should be, should be all good and nothing will happen. And like, like uh, people have been saying, and let's put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever will happen will, will happen for the better. Um, and we shall, in, you know, inshallah, get over this time, look back at it, hopefully in a few years' time, and think, my God, you know, that was an interesting time, was it not? I think there's a Chinese philosopher who once said, may you live in interesting times. And I keep thinking, <laughs> about, that. I keep thinking about that quote a lot, and I keep thinking, no, <laughs> not again. I just want to go back to normal. But inshallah, that time will come. 
Um, and let, let's just get, try to get back as near to normal as possible. Let, let's enjoy the learning. Let, let's now appreciate the effort that the teachers put in. Uh, let's take the, the advantage of it. We are lucky in the United Kingdom that we have this you know, facility to us that, that is free. Um, people in Pakistan, I know, are not going back until January. There's other countries that are, oh. you know, are, are sort of packing up and not, not doing anything for, for months on end. Uh, we have this opportunity. Let, let's use it properly. Let's make the most of it. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll take it from there and everything will, will be all good, inshallah. Inshallah. One last up. Any closing comments? Yeah, the hadith comes to mind. The Prophet said that a person who goes out to seek knowledge, Allah makes the path to Jannah easy for him. So the thing is, um, whenever you go out to seek knowledge, there are going to be challenges in the way, there are going to be difficulties. And this is one of the difficulties and challenges that we're facing in our time. So we don't pack up and we don't give up. But what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to strive even, even harder and try even more. And like Akif and uh, Asif both mentioned, if we learn because we have to learn and, you know, it's a burden, then we're not going to enjoy it. But if we're learning to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to excel in our life, then inshallah we'll enjoy learning. And I think that's the most important thing, that we need to go back to enjoy learning. And when you enjoy learning, then you will want to go back to your teachers. You will you'll want to go back to your centers of learning and you want to go and uh, seek that knowledge because this is the opportunity for youngsters uh, to grasp that moment. Otherwise, you know, afterwards you have regrets. I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done that. But that time passes. And like uh, Akif just hit the nail on the head. You know, sometimes we don't understand the name of Allah, the blessing. In this country, we get free education. You know, we've got good schools, we've got good teachers, and we've got to value them. And we've got to spend time in those centers. Otherwise, what's going to happen is, afterwards, you're going to regret. I didn't value the name of the blessing that I gave me. Go to a different country. You know, people walk for 20, 30, 40 miles a day to get to school. You know, people walk for miles barefooted to go to school. You understand? We're lucky, you know, our schools are around the corner. We can go there and we can seek knowledge. We're lucky, I know, that through internet and we've got, you know, we can learn online. But, you know, people are, you know, they, they, they're dying for knowledge, but they don't have the teachers, they don't have the schools. We've got everything. We value the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go back, be confident, inshallah. The more we get back to normality, inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will get rid of all this uh, difficulty upon us. May Allah Ta'ala make it easy for all of us. May Allah Ta'ala guide us. May Allah keep us steadfast upon Iman. MashaAllah. And one, one last thing that I want to add was that for, for those people who are in the, in the education system now, it's really important that not only you learn, but you learn how to learn. Uh, you learn how to study because that's important because that's a skill that goes on for life. Like, I'm long since I left the education system, the, the, the formal education system. But in my work, I'm continuously learning because technology is changing. Outside of work, in my hobby, I do martial arts. I'm constantly learning new stuff. For new stuff. In my in Dean, I, I go to Molna Sahib and ask some questions all the time because I need a point of reference. And then Molna Sahib like, oh, I'll go look that up. So Molna Sahib learning. So all the time you're learning, there's a, my nephew who's doing some work in uh, some law and stuff. I go to him all the time. I go, what does the law say about this? So you're constantly learning. So don't think, oh, I'm going to learn up until I go to university. I'm going to graduate, get a job, and I'm stop learning. That's not how it works. You're going to carry on learning. So this is a time where you have people who have been through the system that you can lean on to understand how to learn, what's the right way to learn. You can explore, and you're not going to be in a, like, if I start exploring on different ways to learning, I'm going to start falling behind. By this point, I should know how to learn. So this is a good time where you can lean on people who have been there, done that, and learn how to learn, and then enjoy the program. So that's all i got to say on it. So on as I, as I finish, as we finish the podcast, as always, I'd like to thank our guests coming on. So Alhamdulillah, it's been really eye-opening, and especially... I think everyone who's had to do any sort of homeschooling really appreciates teachers. So from, from a parent and from the community, we say thank you to thank you to the teachers and mashallah. May Allah bless you and may Allah continue your work and may Allah grant you, alhamdulillah, high status. Um, in terms of Masjid Umar, we're still building our Masjid Umar. You, you see as you go past the, the big star on the front, inshallah, I'll get some pictures of that as has gone up and we're starting doing some serious some work to seal the building. So you see, you've been seeing it scrolling along the bottom of the of the screen since we've been started. If you want to do it by bank, use a sort code account number. If you want to do it by internet, 
just type in the GoFundMe URL there and that'll get you there. If you want to do it by cash, if you ring uh, by Zulfikar, he'll arrange with you in a COVID safe way of how to get cash to you. So there's procedures and he's done it a few times so he understands how to do it. So give him a shout and he'll sort that out. Mustard has been closed for a long time and it's opened up now. We still need, the mustard still needs funds to run and funds to continue. So please donate generously. I know people are struggling, but mustard still needs to run to run the projects and to help the community. Um, about the YouTube channel, if you like this content, like, subscribe, put comment, tell us what you want uh, more of, what you want less of. Next week's podcast is a very special guest, Alhamdulillah, He's talking about going back to Madrissa. The Madrissas are starting to open, our schools are starting to open, what's the virtues of that? And so we go back to the time of seven o'clock on a Sunday, and it's Molna Fazildar. I've been to a couple of his talks, and Alhamdulillah, he's a very inspirational speaker. So you want to join in on that, you want to. You want to listen into that, inshallah. Final thank you to everybody. Jazakallah khair for coming. Really appreciate your time. I know it's, time is precious. I really appreciate coming on. And inshallah, we'll catch you soon. Jazakallah khair.